So the next hour is dedicated to technology. Now before we get to uh, that piece, I want to show you that on your table is these uh, door prize entry ballots. And uh, one of the door prizes is this uh, orchid, a picture. And this is by uh, Ben Kurtz, a photographer, and Grant Kurtz and Ben Kurtz. Uh, ben Grant is an abstract artist. Ben is a photographer. Together they are autism artistry. They have art for the home, office, or cabin. But I don't think there's any strict rules about where you hang it. So <laughs> if you had somewhere else, you could put it there too. Uh, and their email is roma.kurtz at telus.net if you want to order. And uh, so we're going to have a draw for this a little later. So please fill out your ballots. And then where do we put those? Ballot box by the registration desk? Yes. OK, good. So the next hour is dedicated to technology. And just as you saw in Edgar's video, technology is helping many persons with disabilities thrive in their chosen careers. So today's presenters, who we have up here, will show us both high and low tech solutions that are leveling the playing field for persons with disabilities at work and school. Our first speakers are from the Ability Hub in Calgary. Carmen Ragan is the assistant, Assistive Technology Ambassador for a program called LAUNCH. The LAUNCH program develops realistic transition plans for persons with autism spectrum disorder from high school into an adult world of community involvement and employment. And Dr. Laura Galli is a registered psychologist and the clinical director at the Ability Hub and an adjunct professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Calgary. Her clinical practice focuses on neurodevelopmental disorders. Please welcome Carmen and Laura. Now, are the two of you going to come up here? Okay, come on up here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we're going to start really low tech with me, and then we're going to proceed to Carmen, who's our high tech specialist. So, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to speak with you about some of the programs that we offer at the Ability Hub. That's pretty good for me. I advanced the slide. That's pretty good. Uh, the Ability Hub is focused on improving the quality of life and level of independence for uh, adolescents and adults with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. We're located in Calgary and on the west campus of the University of Calgary. And our facility was purpose built, taking into consideration many of the sensitivities that people on the autism spectrum have uh, with regards specifically to light and noise. So please come and visit us if you really want to come down to Calgary and see some good hockey. Um, <laughs> uh, we have classrooms and therapy rooms and kitchen facilities and a self-contained teaching apartment. We're uh, focused on vocational training and employment readiness and also on building capacity for individuals, parents, and professionals. We have five areas of focus at the Ability Hub, life and work skills development, which we're going to talk mostly about in our presentation. We also offer a resource center that serves as a credible resource um, or source of information for um, ASD. We focus on improving accommodation and wraparound services for those on the spectrum, as well as improving skills of caregivers and um, shaping government policy. We have a number of programs that target the skills of individuals um, to help them work and live independently. Our pursuits programs, so the middle um, icon, target life skills and pre-vocational skill development, which we've heard talk about a lot here today, so before you actually go and apply for that first job. Well, our recruits program uh, really focuses on job site training in, in a variety of settings, including our own in-house food kiosk. Uh, we have partnerships with a number of different businesses in the community, including London Drugs, Safeway, Tim Hortons, and others. But prior to entering into any of these programs in the Ability Hub, um, we start really with a thorough assessment um, and a process that focuses not only on career planning, but more specifically on the broader transition to adulthood. So how can we get individuals to successfully um, enter into adulthood um, and have many um, um, I, I liked actually the presentation yesterday which talked about our goal is a good life and that's very much our focus um, in the launch program. So we start with individuals who are aged uh, 13 and over 
and we conduct an assessment across five domains, which I'll go over in a minute. And then we build an individualized transition plan or life plan for each, um, each individual that we see. And then we try to connect that life plan and those goals with a technology solution that we feel will support that plan over time. So just a word about transition plans. We really feel that um, transition plans have to be specific to the interests and abilities of the individual and also what is their, what is their personal life vision. And a lot of times we work with families whose vision for their adolescent um, might be a little bit different than the individual's vision for their future. So we try to include uh, where possible the individual in, in that visioning process. We, have, we set long and short-term goals and we identify the supports that are going to be necessary to meet those goals. So some considerations when we're doing this process of transition and life planning is when is this um, individual going to graduate? And as we've heard, many um, there's, there are going to be possibilities to stay longer in the school system, but what does that really mean if you stay an extra year or two or three? What actually is happening in terms of curriculum in those extra years in high school that's going to be helpful, uh, particularly in the job category? We look at post-secondary education plans and we know that um, we're not seeing the kind of success rates in post-secondary education that we'd like to see. It's a very big step, even for neurotypical teenagers who leave high school and go on to post-secondary education. It's a big transition. We look at, obviously, interest in, in, in careers. We, we talk about what in, individuals' aptitudes might be and their skills. We look at if there's ever a plan of moving out, and I, I'm sure many of you share my emotion that I hope our children move out one day from our homes, um, and, and, and what kind of supports are going to be necessary to do that. We look at, we take a very careful look at social networks beyond family, because this is a really critical um, aspect of, of whether people will be successful in their adult life and also in their work life. What is their social network? Um, you know, beyond their classroom friends while they're in high school or junior high and into the big community. And, and finally, we look at what funding and community support programs might be available. So this is um, what we call our launch um, assessment model, and we really take a look at all of the dimensions of, of a person's life. So we look at health and well-being, we look at education and employment, communication and social relationships, legal and financial issues, and independent living skills, and self-advocacy. And as we know, issues or problems in any of these domains can actually make it difficult to obtain employment or to maintain employment. So after we've done our assessment, we develop, as I said, for each individual an individualized transition plan. So this is familiar to many people in the school system. They might be called an IEP or an IPP, but we really are looking at this across uh, an individual's lifespan. So we set goals, um, which we arrive at jointly as a team. We um, develop strategies that might be effective in helping them reach their goals, and then we try to pair those with technology-assisted solutions that can help them not only in the moment learning a skill, but also um, serve to be a, that support between visits. We might see a family only every two or three or four months, and in between there, there are many things that actually this individual and their support network can be doing to, to reach those goals. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Carmen, who is going to show you how the magic happens. Thank you, Laura. So my primary role is to help families and individuals determine what areas of their life can be enhanced by the use of technology. Currently, many of these families are working, that we are working with are struggling to find effective interventions that will help them address the difficulties they are experiencing, especially in the areas of health, communication, scheduling, mental health, and education. When it's a challenge to effectively communicate, manage your anxiety, prioritize, or remember what's expected within each task, it makes it really difficult to both gain or maintain meaningful employment. Technology can play a huge role in individuals managing some of these challenge, challenges that are creating barriers for them to find employment. <clears throat> Sorry. With our iPad program, we, are, we recently gifted a young lady an iPad to help her communicate her needs with her family. With the use of a really inexpensive app and very minimal set up, we were helped to, able to give this lady the one thing she'd been missing, which was a voice. Having a voice opens possibilities for her to widen social opportunities, express her needs, and maybe even one day obtain employment. 
We know technology can help. Sorry. <laughs> we know technology can help, but how can we help you find the right app? Currently, there's over a million apps for, available for download in the iTunes Store. Technology is constantly evolving and growing with approximately 5,000 apps each week being added. Many app developers have caught on to the popularity of technology within the disability community and have increased the demand for innovative solutions and are labeling apps to be autism related. The problem is many of these apps have a limited applicability or are simply just games. The other challenge can be that apps are effective but are challenging and complex to tailor. This can pose a barrier, especially for those who self-identify as not being tech savvy. My advice is simply to read reviews, do your research before spending your money, find an app that is within your comfort level, and remember that not every app is right for everyone. Doing this will hopefully help reduce the frustration that some individuals experience that can often lead to technology abandonment. So once we find an app, how do we tailor it to meet the needs of the individual? The first thing we look at is which device is the best fit to meet their needs. If you're looking for technology-based support to help them navigate the city bus, then giving them an iPad that has no connection to Wi-Fi <coughs> is not an effective tool for them to use. Maybe an iPhone would be a better solution. With apps, we look for the ones that are the best fit, not only for the goal, but also take in consideration the level of comfort that both the individual and their supports have in using technology. If they are new or uncomfortable with technology, it's not a great idea to pick a complex app. This will only lead to frustration and often abandonment. Don't make the individual adapt to the solution. Figure out ways to make the solutions work for them. This is your chance to get creative and think outside the box. iPads offer many built-in accessibility functions that made applications easy and simple. Just disable the internet, increase text size for easier viewing, or simply add a password. Passwords can be really important to save you time and frustration. I've had many supports come to me um, letting me know that their individuals have accidentally deleted their schedules when asked to complete a difficult task. <laughs> exactly. So the, the great thing about iPad is it allows you to use real world, real world photos. It's much easier to identify and generalize when using real pictures. Utilize pictures within their environment, their friends, their workplace, their favorite objects, objects and use ones that you have readily available. Giving someone a strip with pecs as an op or a strip of pecs with french fries as an option when you know you're not going to McDonald's is never going to end well. <laughs> so use the photos that you know you can access of things that, that are readily available. You need to provide training. Most individuals can see the possible potential when using an iPad in the workplace or educational environment, but what happens when they encounter difficulties just turning on the device? This is where training becomes valuable not only for the individual but also for their supports. Some supports struggle to see the benefits of using technology-assisted solutions, not because they don't think they will work, but because they fear the technology themselves or have limited views of the capability. For example, in some classrooms, the iPad has been merely used as a reward or a toy. Instead of, use a lot, instead of utilizing it to enhance lessons and engage the children in more meaningful and tactile manners, what child doesn't love to play on an iPad or use the Xbox? So use that to your advantage. <clears throat> Training individuals and supports on the use of an iPad often sparks new ideas and ways to incorporate technology into the daily routine. You don't know what you know until you know it. This increased level of confidence often promotes buy-in and motivation to ensure the successful implementation of the device. We always encourage both our individuals and their supports to start small and build on those successes. It doesn't have to be big to make an impact. Even the small stuff counts. I have a 13-year-old daughter, Emily, who's on the spectrum. She loves technology and will often ask us to find her favorite YouTube video again and again and again. And she can ask us 10 times within 10 minutes. So this was extremely frustrating for us. So we taught her to use Siri. She now asks Siri to find that video for her. And the amazing thing is um, she has to work on her speech clarity because if Siri doesn't understand her, she can't find it. But Siri is amazing. She never gets frustrated. She can ask her 15 times. <laughs> And Siri will always calmly say, I'm sorry, Emily, I don't know what you want. <laughs> so it's perfect. So planning for success. Identifying the challenges, setting a goal, creating strategy, implementing and revising. In order to achieve success, we will repeat the cycle many times. No one app fits everyone's needs. For many individuals, this process will take many attempts and adjustments before getting it right. It's all about finding the right app for the right person. 
Training the individual versus group training. Our pilot project began training families on a one-to-one -one model, which is extremely effective but not cost efficient. So now as we move on to the next phase of our project, we are introducing a group model. This model not only allows us to support more families and individuals, but it also creates an environment where the parents and caregivers are given the opportunity to expand their social network and support their peers. This group environment allows individuals with similar ability levels to work together and be the experts for each other. Being given the opportunity to share success and experience with others helps us to build capacity not only within ourselves but within our communities. So how can we use iPads to help individuals with disabilities gain and maintain employment? We heard a lot of talk yesterday about intimidation in the employment process, worry about communication issues in the workplace, worry about the ability to complete the required tasks without supports, worry about interviews or finding employment, and the anxiety around the whole process. This is a great area for technology to be utilized. We have apps to reduce stress, practice interview skills, or even task sequence your workday. This past year, I worked with a bright young lady, Carla, who when working at her volunteer job required full supports. She needed the support to provide directions and prompts to stay on task and complete her daily routines. Only Carla wanted to be more independent. So together we created a set of detailed task sequencing schedules outlining her tasks and routines required for her job. At first it took a lot of retraining and involvement from both her family, supports, and employer, but over time she learned how to use, utilize the iPad and provide direction versus having to rely on the verbal prompts from her supports. Eventually they were able to fade back their support and watch her grow and blossom. They, at the end of the year, Carla no longer required supports to be with her at work. She now is independently able to hold down a paid employment position. She's no longer a volunteer. So on that note, I have the pleasure of leaving you with this little clip of Carla explaining for herself. Thank you. My name is Carla. I use my iPad for volunteering at Renfrew. And I used it at Renfrew for work so I didn't need an aid. I schedule to get up, get ready for breakfast, get ready for bus. I use it for appointments. I use it for making my lunch every day. It's not, it is easy now, but when I first started, it was hard. Now it's getting easier to use it for regular routines. Nice. And does this help you be more independent, Carla? Yes. And are you happier? Yes. So is it better to have people nag at you or be able to have the iPad tell you what to do? iPad is better. Hello, when we first started and picked apps, did they all work? No. No. Did we have to try lots of different apps? Yes. But did we find one that worked really well for you? Yes. And did it help you take your volunteer job and turn it into something else? Yes. And what happened? I turned it into the work. You turned into work and did you get paid? Yes. It feels good to do things on your own, doesn't it? Yes. That's great. Technology can be a challenge for all of us. My wife is currently doing her master's, so she's writing her thesis. She didn't know how to turn the computer on. Someone had turned it off and she was like, Where? she phoned me at work, where's the button? I said, for what? To turn the computer on. I said, well, it's, I'm trying to explain to her where it is. So she goes and wakes up our son, who's 17. He goes upstairs and shows her where it is. OK. The next day, she said, hey, I turned the computer on myself. He says, we're very proud of you. <laughs> so technology can be challenging for anybody. So it's uh, good for her. Like that, That's fantastic. Up next, we have uh, Chad Lehman from Vancouver. Chad is the director of development for the Neil Squire Society, which specializes in the use of technology to empower Canadians with physical disabilities. Chad led the Neil Squire Society launch of online learning programs, which included free one-to-one -one computer tutoring, as well as employability, a 12-week employment course focusing on career development and wellness. Please welcome Chad Lehman. Hey, uh, oh yeah, that works. Okay, so um, yeah, I am from Vancouver, so uh, I now know the pain of all Alberta hockey teams as mine is now in the basement with you guys, so uh, thanks so much. Before I get too much into this. Um, I just want to quickly recognize like all the work that goes on by people not up on the stage but behind the scenes. Tina, um, Krissa, the tech guys, the people up front. So if you learned something here today, I encourage you right now to give them a round of applause for putting this great event together that we've all been <laughs> had a chance to do. Where's the clicker? 
the clicker. There we go. So I work for an organization called the Neil Squire Society, which was named after a guy named Neil. So Neil was a young university student, and he got in a car accident. This was in the 80s. And he broke his neck right at the C1, C2 level. Um, so it's a very high-level spinal cord injury. So he couldn't use his legs, couldn't use his arms, and actually he broke his neck. He couldn't use his tongue. So you had this bright young guy that used to play on the basketball team that's now literally trapped in his body. He can't even speak. So his cousin, Bill Cameron, invented a system so Neil, by sipping and puffing on that tube there, was connected to a Morse code machine. So the sips and puffs were translated to dots and dash, and it was plugged into a very state-of-the-art Apple IIe computer in the early 80s. So by Neil sipping and puffing on this tube, he was able to communicate. He was able to say things like, I'm thirsty, I would like some water, or I hate the show, change the channel, I want to watch CBC. It gave him the ability to use technology to eliminate some of the barriers that he was facing. Um, so they helped Neil, and then a lot of other people at GF Strong Rehab Hospital said, you know, there's some accommodations that I need. So when Neil passed, um, they started a nonprofit organization, in his memory, to help use technology to eliminate or minimize some of the barriers that people face with disabilities. And it's our 30th anniversary this June. So if you're coming out to Vancouver, we're having an awesome open house. You can eat food trucks, you can tell me all the problems about the Canucks, you should come if you're in Vancouver. Okay, so um, you've heard some statistics. Uh, some of these you've already heard today. I want to see, like, are you remembering some of these? So I got a couple questions for you guys here. First off, who here's used a smartphone today or a tablet? Put up your hands. Nerds, every single one of you. Um, so uh, just to, to give you a bit of an idea here, let me just go back to Neil. So Neil, in the 1980s, could control a computer with in his mouth. If you can't touch a touchscreen device, you cannot use a touchscreen device. There is no like mouth interface that Neil used to use to control a mobile device. So technology has changed incredibly, but it hasn't always included people with disabilities. There's still work to be done. Just give you a, a bit of an idea here. Think of how your life would be different if you didn't have that with you all the time. Okay, so this stat has come out a couple times. So I'm going to see if any of you remember this. They told me don't walk off the stage, so that was like tempting me. So Mark, what's the disability rate in Canada? Like, give me a guess here. It's a number between zero and less than 100. Oh, um, 12%. Oh, he's close. He's close. A little bit higher. What do you think? 15%. A little lower. So we're, we're getting close. We've got an easy one here now. Oh, 13. 13.7%. And I didn't take the clicker to go. So good job, guys. Good job. So... Uh, that's the disability rate in Canada, which is about one in seven Canadians, or about 3.8 million. And, and there's been a lot of other numbers here about like the market impact of that. Now, there's some other work that's going on in other parts of the country that is kind of interesting. Ontario has been pushing through, um, and this process started in 2005, so it gives you an idea how long these things can take, and the roadmap is to, to 2025. Um, but it's called the Accessibility of Ontario's with Disabilities Act. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of things that like businesses have to do. Uh, a part of it is uh, the first phase that is now in law is a customer service accessibility standard. Um, and if you fail the standard, there's a fine, a fairly significant one. So I want you guys again, I'm going to hop down. Give me, give me a guess. Like, how much do you think if, if you get fined under this act, like, what is the maximum penalty you could pay? I have no idea. Give me a number, just to like, guess here. $100. Way more, way more. Give a guess. 10000 More. Fifty. Five zero? Lower, lower. I should do prices right, like closest without going over here. Uh, 25,000? A little less. 20. Lower. 18,999. <laughs> 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 a little lower than that. Well, okay, uh, 17. Keep going down. 15. 15, on the nose. He wins a new car. There we go. $15,000 fine. And this is just the first phase of this work. So it's, uh, there's going to be other things along the way that go along. So it gives you a bit of an idea um, of some like the, the power that government may have to actually force on these things for change. Uh, in Italy, they have um, a standard that says workforces have to have a certain percentage of people with disabilities. Let's ask our panelists here. What do you think the percentage of the workforce has to be? 20%. Lower. 
Ten percent. A little lower. Seven point two five. Uh, seven, we'll round, we'll round, we'll cover the decimal, seven percent. Seven percent of the workforce of all employers in Italy have to be a person with a disability. If they're not, that organization gets fined. The size of the fine depends on the size of the organization. So if you employ like 10,000 people and you are way under that percent, your fine is massive. What they do is they take that money and give it to uh, disability service providers to help serve people with disabilities. So it's a very interesting model where that money, if you don't employ people, you don't include people, you will pay for the programs that will narrow that gap. I'm not sure if any government of Alberta people are here, but like, this is a good program. You can do this. Especially considering the disability rate is like 13%. That's still only half of people with disabilities. Okay, here's some depressing stats for you. Um, and we've seen some of these stats again, so maybe you remember. And I'm getting a little short on time, so I'll jump this without quizzing you guys here. Um, so that, and this is from the Participation and Activity Li Living Survey, which is a Government of Canada survey, which is a good one to go by because it was the largest sort of statistics they did on employment rates, people with disabilities. And also, it's where about 60% of your tax dollars go. So what the federal government thinks with disability is an important thing in terms of what they fund. Um, so you can see there's about a 25% gap in employment rates between people with disabilities uh, and without dis disabilities. Um, and this chart, which is probably a little small, um, from a totally other government source, so the numbers are slightly different, but still shows the gap. So the top line is employment of your, you know, regular population. Uh, the green line is employment of people with disabilities. And then those bottom two lines are youth with and without disabilities. So you can see for youth with a, uh, uh, with a disability is that number that we saw thrown around earlier, about 70%. So it shows the, the huge gap in between uh, inclusion for a lot of people with disabilities. Okay, so that's my statistics piece. I'm going to talk quickly about our programming. Um, and I thought a bit about the slide, especially after hearing what uh, Kathy had to say this morning uh, about the wage subsidy program, which is a new program for us. Um, so who here works for an organization that is less than 500 people in general? Show of hands. Do you want $30,000? Because that's what this program will give you to hire someone with a disability as a wage subsidy. Um, but I did. I, I thought a bit about what Kathy said this morning um, about that. And so that's the piece of this program. The other part is that business awareness and development stuff. So this program does provide the employers a wage subsidy, but we do have job coaches that go on and do the on-site mentoring. You've seen some of their sites. Uh, we've partnered with Chambers of Commerce across the country in terms of raising that knowledge. And uh, those Chambers of Commerce are helping us put on job fairs across the country. Very similar to what you saw last night for hiring people with disabilities. So um, this is a program funded by the Government of Canada. Um, and yeah, w we can maybe like argue over a beer about the, the benefits or the drawbacks of wages later on. Um, another federal funded program we have is the employability program. So this is a program, uh, it's like a 12 week program. Has a lot of focus on career development, similar to some of the other programs I'm sure you have here in Alberta. Uh, the bit that I think that makes this somewhat unique is also a real focus on wellness. So the soft skills that someone needs to go to work. Um, most people that have taken this program, and again, primarily people with physical disabilities, have been out of the workforce for a number of years. So there's things such as healthy sleep, time management, anger management, managing your medications, managing your pain. So it's trying to help build that holistic base while also thinking about like what are your skills and your abilities and how's that lap to the la labor market and those sort of activities. So those are like our two really large government funded programs. Um, but we still stayed really true to our roots in terms of like that one-to-one -one computer access and helping people access computers. Um, so we run a free computer tutoring program most people come in for a couple hours a week, work with a tutor. Sometimes they drop in otherwise um, and learn uh, what they want to learn. This is unlike government programs because government likes to make taxpayers, right? So a lot of the government-funded programs are very much like employment-driven and outcomes. How can we help John get back to work so he can pay us instead of us paying him a disability subsidy? Um, this is really driven by, like, what do you want to learn? If you want to learn, like, how do I help Mark's wife turn on the computer? Or what is my kid doing on Facebook? Or I want to talk with my grandkids on the other side of the country through Skype. That's totally okay. Uh, and so we have that sort of grassroots kind of social inclusion through that. Um, but a lot of work that has to happen in the first place is how do I access a computer with my disability? How if I can't use my arms while I use a computer? Or I have a very limited range of motion. So in our lab in Vancouver, we have over 250 different pieces of hardware, software, a mice. Um, the theory is anyone can use a computer. You might have a different way that you put information in. 
or you take information out. So I wanted to show uh, a couple of these th uh, pieces that we have. Oh, very quickly. So I'm from Vancouver, um, but we have offices across Canada, and a lot of our work's being done through online learning, which is what I did for a very long time at the organization. So the way we've grown and reached more people is through partnering with other community organizations. Um, and I know there's a lot of work with collaboration talking here. So I've been lucky to be in Alberta for the week. I met some people at Bull Valley College and in Calgary earlier in the week, uh, and a lot of people up here. But if anyone feels like their organization has a need for this, um, some like free online computer tutoring or free employment programs, I'd be very happy to talk with you and like see like how can we do that. We've worked with Indian bands uh, across BC and in northern Saskatchewan. But you can see on that map, there's like a real cluster of like houses and education centers in BC, same in Saskatchewan, and there's like this big gap where Alberta is. So maybe there's some people in physical disabilities that we can help empower together here. Oh, bonus question. I forgot about this. Um, what percent? How am I doing? F I got three minutes and I have three one minute videos. So I will answer this question for you. 82% of people with disabilities use some sort of assistive device to work. So just give you an idea like the need of how the appropriate solution can really enable somebody to go forward. And again, that's from the Canadian Survey on Disability, which was actually published on International Day People with Disabilities last year. So I want to show you a couple of things here. Um, lots of accommodations are like simple or easy, but for someone that may have a very high level of disability, uh, these videos give you an idea of like what the possibilities are, the right piece of technology. This one's a little drier. Um, but if you guys can roll the dragon video, that'd be great. And Dragon Pad will open. Dragon Pad includes basic text formatting features as well as the ability to save and print documents. You can use Dragon Pad when you do not need the capability of a full featured word processor. When you have finished dictating, you can say, copy all to clipboard to copy your text to the clipboard and paste that to copy the text from the clipboard into any other program. Although it is similar to WordPad, comma, DragonPad is customized for use with Dragon and contains speech recognition features that are not available in WordPad, period. So that was all done by voice, all that typing there. Now, it's getting better. It doesn't work that well right out of the box, but you can like train a voice profile so it learns how you talk and how you speak to have higher level accuracy. So a uh, hands-free way to basically use a keyboard. You can also really like control a computer too, like and navigate the internet. So that's a lot harder. Um, but gives you an idea of someone who may not be able to use their arms can still use a computer and probably type faster and spell better than you. Um, next video I think is my eye tracking one. Now this is not like a commercially available uh, piece here. Um, the son that we have a young engineer that's working with us um, that also has a disability and he's just like totally done this on his own with like his spare time like hey Chad check out what I did I think it's awesome I think you'll think it's awesome too. So these LED lights are the kind of bounce that I guess off your eyes and use that to track your eye position and your yeah. eye blinking and movement and stuff like that. Just, just ballpark. Like, how much does this eye camera thing cost? Hundred bucks. Great. And then the source that you're using to, uh, this open source is free. Oh, yeah. And then you got, uh, you got the source code, so you can customize it and do whatever you want. You can add more options, or even it comes with a keyboard. So you can hold your. Oh, so like you can, like can look at the keys on your keyboard or whatever, right? That would be like, you know, this, like if, you know, it came in like your iPad or your device, right? Because so much touch typing in that, but if you could look at those keys too, you could literally type by looking at a device, which would help address the issue of how you use a touchscreen device if you can't touch the device. Yeah. Malag graduated with honors from SFU. Um, so yeah, he's a pretty, pretty amazing young man. Uh, the final video I want to show is the Joe. So this is like the, like the, evolution of what uh, we first done with Neil. So this is controlling a whole computer by a joystick that goes into your mouth. Hi, my name is Mark. This is how I use my joust too. I'm paralyzed from the shoulders down as a result of a spinal cord injury. And I use my joust all the time, many days, many hours, and I'll show you how I use it. Here is Facebook. I go on Facebook enough that uh, I'm not addicted, but I use enough of them. Here's a post from my mom. She says, uh, 
hey, honey, give me a call. And I said, Mom, come on, you were just here for six weeks. We don't have anything left to talk about. Um, another thing I do, I like to plan vacations. Here's looking up some hotels on Expedia and hopefully plan a vacation. Uh, another thing I like to do is watch movies. Here's a movie. This is a movie about, it's an IMAX movie. It's about oil fires that were in Kuwait after the um, Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. It's a pretty interesting movie. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm over. You can, you can cut it there. Um, All right. Yelp. The, the, the actual, where I got this on YouTube, he goes on for like 12 minutes, and the point is, he can do anything on the computer um, through this, this device. So it gives you an idea how technology can really enable somebody to fully participate uh, in our communities. And th that's me. Thanks very much. I look forward to talking to you guys afterwards. Cheers. Thanks, Chad. That uh, the second last device really gives a whole new meaning to the word iPad. There you go. Oh, hey, it's the second day. I'm getting down to the bottom material. <laughs> now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Lori Ospelston. She's uh, been a senior assistive technology specialist at Grant McEwen University for the last 15 years. I guess it's now just called McEwen University, right? Yeah, Lori pairs students who have disabilities with technologies that open doors to university life, knowledge, and classwork. Lori tells, uh, tells us she loves seeing the impact of the right piece of technology can have on a student's learning and self-confidence. Please join me in welcoming Lori Ospaldiston. Lori. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I recognize this is a, a conference or a symposium on, edu or on employment, um, but for the majority of the students that, that come to a post-secondary institution, they're generally coming with an eye to employment. They're coming for, to, for an education, to gain skills and, uh, and knowledge base that will help them progress and, and find gainful employment that's satisfying and interesting and, and hopefully lifelong. I think I might steal the microphone from you because this back and forth, I know my voice is uh, cutting in and out. Thank you. In my previous life, I was a chick singer in a band, so this is like I'm having a flashback here. <laughs> no the other pants anymore, though I've, I've gotten rid of those. <laughs> don't tempt me. I do a mean Ethel Merman, too, if you don't watch it. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of uh, have a perspective or a, a flow for the, the presentation. So uh, looking at the past, present, and future. So uh, the past, just sharing some statistics and trends that uh, we have seen at McEwen, but also I think are fairly common across the board on in uh, post-secondary institutions, certainly in Alberta. Um, and, and quite probably across the nation. Talk about uh, the present, so what we're currently doing, just a very small snippet, Reader's Digest version of, of what we're doing um, to reduce the barriers that students with disabilities encounter when they move into a post-secondary environment. And then the future, some of the uh, positives, the exciting, wonderful things that are currently happening, and some of the challenges, and perhaps you can take those away and, and be mindful of those and, and perhaps be part of, of uh, solving some of those challenges or, or finding something to, to d move forward. So this is probably quite hard to see, but one of the questions that was posed uh, when I was putting this together was basically what do you do in a post-secondary to support students with disabilities? So these are statistics from 2012-13 because we haven't quite finished 13-14, so I'm going back just a little bit. So we had a total of 733 students uh, identify with our department. Of those, about 90 uh, either had no documentation of a disability or were in the process of trying to somehow uh, attain documentation of disability. It could be um, psychoeducational assessment, needing to see a specialist, those kinds, kinds of things. So. Um, we're, we're dealing with numbers when you look at the percentage, that's a percentage of 733 students. So exam accommodations are the biggest, uh, the most time consuming, the biggest part of what our department does. Uh, so a student may require extra time for an exam or isolation or special technology or a particular format for an exam. 
Uh, we provide alternate format textbooks, so many students uh, can't work with a standard print textbook. And if you've ever, I, mean, I think we've all carried, you know, so a few good heavy books over the years, and and many people that's that's quite difficult to do, or even to hold or turn the page in a book. So alternate format text primarily these days means electronic, but it could be uh, uh, braille or large format. Um, Assistive technology assessments, this is a big part of my job, looking at what a student's planning to study, what are the barriers that they may encounter due to their disability, and is there some technology that could eliminate that barrier or reduce that barrier. Uh, assistive technology training, so once we've re recommended technology, they need to learn how to use it, so that's a, a big portion. Uh, academic strategy instruction to help students to learn what, what method of learning might work best for them. Uh, reduce course loads. So some students, a full course load of five courses is, is very difficult because perhaps it takes them longer to work through their course material or complete assignments or research. So many students, 120, um, were doing reduced course load. Uh, CART and interpreter services also for the deaf and hard of hearing students, uh, that's also part of the services we provide. So this is kind of, there's a lot of information on this slide. At the bottom, we have the categories of disability that we, we classify. It's actually kind of a provincial, um, all the institutions have the same types of categories so that when we submit our numbers to uh, advanced ed, they know we're all, we're all kind of comparing apples to apples. So uh, we work with students with acquired brain injury, ADHD, chronic medical or systemic um, conditions, learning disability, blind, partially sighted. I don't need to read it to you. You're probably quite able to. Um, but mobility, psychiatric, other which might be fetal alcohol syndrome, for example. And then the, it also shows the statistics for, for uh, students that we weren't able to sort of peg into a category. What I haven't got on is a legend. So the, the blue bar shows students who are identifying with a primary disability. That's the one that's causing the biggest barriers. And the red, uh, shows a secondary disability. So uh, just I just wanted to sort of show that uh, it isn't always straightforward and, and cookie cutter. We often have students who have um, more complex needs because there's more than one disability at, that's affecting their, their learning. So the biggest trend, I, I could speak on about trends for my whole 15 minutes, but the biggest trend that we've seen in the last three years is students with psychiatric diagnoses, and this could be as a primary or secondary disability. Um, in the past three years, it's almost doubled. Not exactly sure what that means. I don't know if it means that there are more, there's more diagnoses. I don't know if that means that the medication and treatment is better for some people, so they're able to embark on a post-secondary career. I, I don't know exactly what those numbers mean, but I think across the board, all the post-secondary institutions that we've communicated with are experiencing very similar numbers. And this just shows the difference between, the blue line is showing the student numbers that we've had over the past three years, just physical number of, of bodies, and the red line is showing the number of disabilities that we're accommodating. So uh, more complex situations, more complex needs, uh, and, and more complex services required. So I really struggled. The request when, uh, when I spoke to uh, Chris and Tina about this presentation, they said, oh, talk about technology. And it, it's hard to know how to pigeonhole or how to present it. So I broke it into two parts. Uh, specialized technology, so where it's a very specific disability that has very sp specific uh, technology tied to it. So I will start with that. So for students at our institutions who are hard of hearing, who are not using a uh, CART system or uh, interpreter services, they may use an FM system in class to hear the lecturer, or we do have a uh, couple of students this year using iPads with a specialized microphone and uh, the recordium app, recordium app, and uh, we've seen good success with that. Uh, for students who are blind, uh, they generally need a screen re reader so that they can use a computer. Uh, one of my co-workers is blind and, and uses JAWS. He is our resident expert, which is fantastic because I really don't know very much about it. So it's nice to have, have someone on staff that's really well versed. Uh, tactile graphics. Perhaps uh, a student is taking massage therapy and, and wants to 
physically feel what it, the breakdown of, of musculature or bones or we've used it for a lot of different different types of, of coursework. Braille displays. This is primarily if a student is a Braille user, they'll they will um, use a Braille display to read their textbooks if they're not using screen reader. Braille, Braille embossers and then scan and read tools. So those are all fairly specific to a to a blind user. For low vision users, they generally use screen magnification software of some kind, not always. Also scan and read tools. So if they have a handout in class, they can scan it, hear it and video magnifiers. And the, the graphics on this slide show kind of a larger CCTV. So perhaps for looking at a graphic in a book. Uh, and then the smaller handheld devices, which the student might use in a chemistry lab or something like that. So this is the versatile technology where it's one piece of technology, but it can address a whole ton of uh, different disability types because of the nature of the, of the technology. So at McEwen, we use Read and Write Gold. Uh, I know that in the K-12 system, there's a lot of schools that are using Read and Write Gold. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, Kurzweil users, particularly in the uh, post-secondary environment. They all basically do the same thing. It's like having different models of cars. You know, they all get you from point A to point B. It's just kind of what the environment looks like. So uh, we use this for students with per uh, perhaps a learning disability in writing or reading maybe attention challenges, processing speed, um, but also for students who perhaps are in pain and reading is uh, difficult or holding a book is difficult or sitting in a position in which they can hold a book is difficult. So being able to hear your textbook read to you can be extremely helpful. Uh, voice recognition, Chad already uh, showed you a brief demo. Uh, certainly students who have mobility challenges uh, benefit from this software, but we've also found that students who perhaps uh, have struggles with attention, have trouble getting their ideas out as quickly as they're coming to mind, they can speak them faster than they're, they're able to um, perhaps write them down. Uh, I've also seen students where their written expression skills are are very low, but their verbal expressive skills are very high. And that would be a student who would really benefit from voice recognition technology. So it isn't, we think of it as a mobility tool, but there are other, other uses for it as well. Okay, this is uh, note taking. So students are going to class and they should be taking notes. Um, there are very, very many reasons why a student might struggle with note taking. It might be a physical challenge where they're holding a pen, writing as quickly as the prof talks, and honestly, I think we've all heard people who talk 90 miles an hour in our educational experience or other environments, so it can be very difficult. So um, it can be a mobility thing, it could be processing, memory, uh, pain, focus, many, many reasons for challenges with note taking. So. We still use digital recorders, th those are not tools that are completely outdated, but we have moved away from them quite significantly in just the past couple of years. Uh, because there are some incredible tools out there now that uh, seem to address things a little bit better. So what is a smart pen? If you're not familiar with them, uh, you can buy them Best Buy, quite honestly, um, Future Shop. Basically, you use a notebook that comes from the company. Each page in the notebook, if you look very clo closely, it has little pixels, and the configuration of pixels per page is different on each page. The pen, the ones that we use are a little bit old school. There's a new Cosmic one that works with the iPad, but we're still using the old school ones. So the pen has a camera in it in the end, and it also has a recording device built in. And as you write, the pen knows where you are on the page as you're writing, but it's also recording at the same time. So if there's a concept or you wrote something and you think, what on earth was I thinking when I wrote that? You can go and click with the pen beside where you wrote that particular note and hear exactly what the professor was saying at that time because you've recorded it. So uh, it's a fantastic tool, particularly for students who, pr who prefer to write their notes or for students who are taking math, chemistry, physics, anything with formulas, it's especially good, drawings, acupuncture, nursing, um, it can be an excellent tool for students. 
And then lastly, um, we've been using a program in the last couple of years that I'm so excited about. Um, I see a couple people who have already heard me talk about this in other contexts. Um, but we've been using a program called Audio Note Taker, and I just think it's brilliant. And so I wanted to share it because not only for disabilities, but for anyone. I use this for taking minutes um, in, in meetings, that kind of thing. So it's excellent. If you could click on the video and play it for like one minute and ten seconds, that would be fantastic. We can't all do things in the same way. That's why it's important to help people who need to do things differently. But this is getting harder. Even though the number of students who need support is increasing, budgets for this support are decreasing. The challenge becomes how to provide these students with accessible, independent learning options and provide a cost-effective solution for administrators. We like a challenge. Sonocent Audio Note Taker is software that's about creating independence both for students and for those supporting them. It's a study tool for students who struggle with note taking, which is both simple to use and simple to administer. This is how it works. The software chunks speech phrase by phrase, enabling you to use color to highlight the most important things as you're hearing them. It's like a highlighter pen for speech. You can also organize your recording into manageable sections, like paragraphs. So now you know what you should listen back to. You'll never miss important information. You can focus on listening instead of on writing, and you can create your notes in your own time. And that's not all. It's easy to edit your audio, and you can add text, slides, and images alongside. When you're done, extract your color highlights into a new file. You can also export your notes to view on other devices. Record from our free app, or import audio recorded from elsewhere. You can even use Audio Note Taker to capture online videos, webinars, and Skype calls. Administering audio note taker couldn't be simpler. There are various Thank you. I know I'm past, and so I'll just talk really, really fast. Uh, just some of the positives, because there's some incredible things going on, and, and I think many of you are, are part of that. Uh, there is some funding available to post-secondary students to support services and technology in their educational system. Um, block funding from Innovation and Advanced Ed goes to each post-secondary institution. Uh, it, can be, it can be used for technology loans for students who, who ca can't qualify. The technology is decreasing in cost. A lot of platforms have assistive technology built in. Students are becoming more tech savvy, so it's very unusual that we have a student that doesn't know how to turn on the computer. Uh, and also students are, are ready for the workplace because they have these tools, they've been using them, they're working, and so it, they've been successful. The challenges for the future, there's a small percentage of students that can qualify for funding to support their post-secondary education. Um, funded students can incur a higher, higher debt. So if a student is using a uh, student loan, they have a disability, they're on a reduced course load, what should be a four-year degree is now a six-year degree, but you have six years worth of student loan. So that, that is problematic. Um, staying current because the technology does date itself and especially if your education is taking six years that becomes you know things become obsolete quite quickly and um, when students move into and transition into employment they don't often realize that there's DRES funding to support that piece and support technology that they may require so those are the challenges but I uh, encourage you to take those think about it maybe we can find some solutions thank you <laughs>